All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm joined by Stephen H. Goodman, who is in the New York area. How are you doing, Stephen? I'm doing great, John. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, and Stephen is the President Chief Executive Officer of SHG Planning, which is a state planning and business succession specialist. And that's what we want to talk about today is the second part of that is the business succession and succession planning. Um, so, Stephen, is it fair to say that uh, a lot of people know, uh, know what succession planning is, obviously, a lot, and most people would agree that succession planning is a good thing. Uh, okay, so that's two. The third part, actually doing it, not as many people do it as they should as should be doing it. Uh, that's one hundred percent correct. Yeah. So, so what is it? Why number one? Why do you think people avoid success, um, succession planning? And second off, um, how should they how should they start to go about it? Well, I'll give you there's, there's a couple of reasons that I would say are the main reasons. Let's start with. If you're if you're if business succession is important to you, it's because you own a business and mm -hmm. people who own businesses are entrepreneurs and they are constantly putting out fires and they they focus on what's important today. Every day they wake up, there's 10 things on their hit list that they have to deal with. And for them to pull away from that and say, I'm going to not focus for a period of time on what I need to do today to focus on what I should be planning for in the future, what ends up happening is that that's a hard thing to get people to do. So that, that's probably the first big reason. Second big reason, especially with family businesses where there's kids involved and kids not involved in the business, it's a very, very difficult emotional decision because I'm a dad, my kids happen to not be in, in business with me, but you know, as a, as a father, you know, throughout your kids growing up, they play you against one another. And, you know, why did you give Johnny this? And I didn't get it. And, and, you know, this one got a TV and I didn't get a TV and this one got an iPhone and I didn't get an iPhone. And, and you tell your kids, cause you truly believe this, that I love you all the same and I'll always treat you the same. And, you know, your brother may have gotten something cause he's older than you and you'll get it when you get to his age. And then one day you wake up and you're 70, 65, 70 years old and you say, oh my God, I spent my whole life telling my kids how I love them the same. And now I got this big business and I got one of my kids in the business and I got two of my kids not in the business. And like, how am I gonna divvy up my assets? Like I've always told them I'm gonna give them everything the same, but is it gonna be fair for me to take a business and split it a third, a third, a third between my three kids when two of them don't really know anything about the business? you know? Or if I'm going to give the business to my son or daughter in the business, how in God's name am I going to have enough other things to give to my other two kids so they're going to think it's fair? So what ends up happening is a lot of times dad, because it's still in yeah. that generation, it's still mostly men who run those businesses. Dad says, you know, if I shut up and say nothing and do nothing, nobody's going to know what I feel. And right. someday I'll be dead. And then it'll be a disaster. But like, I don't want to not have a relationship with my kids and my grandkids. So I'm going to shut up and I'm going to just not address it. And we'll go along our merry way. Because if I do address it, one or more of my kids is not going to like the outcome. And their spouses are going to like it even less. And then I run the risk of my child and my grandchildren not having the relationship with me that I wish I had. So I just shut mm -hmm. up and I do nothing. So those yeah. are your, probably your two major reasons why people don't do succession planning. Yeah, you know, it's a really good point, especially the 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 emotional one, obviously family relation. Hey, back in the old days uh, in Ireland where I'm from, it was just the eldest got the farm, the rest of them could either go become priests, nuns, or they could emigrate to the US. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's easier when you have that structure so everybody knows they know what place they're in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so obviously, um, obviously avoiding avoidance is never a very good strategy. Uh, and so 
what, so how should people be looking at succession planning? And even in the scenarios that you outlined there, I mean, obviously these are just difficult um, decisions to make, but as we have seen historically, I mean, there's a lot of businesses kind of collapse once the the original you know driver of that business has exited the scene. And let's face it, families are very good at destroying businesses sometimes. Sometimes they do really well sure. with them, but they're also very good at uh, destroying. So what is... Um, what should somebody what should somebody be doing if they're in that situation well look there's a there's a couple of things that happen that result in the right things being done generally number 1 you have to have somebody who allocates some time to dealing with this you know i i i would like to say i'm the messiah but i'm not the messiah you know I'm very, very good at what I do, but I need a partner in that being the, the client. If mm -hmm. the client doesn't want to play their role, no matter how smart I am, I'm not going to be able to help them. So you, A, you have to have somebody who's willing to allocate time. You have to have somebody like me, somebody who's really good at like, we had this meeting. Now, what does everybody need to do for the next meeting? And when is the next meeting? And writing a summary of what happened in the meeting. So everybody kind of knows what they have to think about. So you kind of like keep the ball kind of moving. So that's important. You need to have a good team of advisors. So if the client either bifurcates his advisors, like meets with me by himself, his estate attorney by himself, his accountant by himself, which some of them do because they want to be in control. They want to, mm -hmm. they don't want to get teamed up by all their advisors. So they bifurcate everybody. That doesn't work. So you got to have a somebody on the team that kind of keeps the ball going, a client that's willing to allocate time, a client is willing to not bifurcate everybody, and then a team of advisors that their egos don't get in the way and they're willing to work together. So like one of them, which would normally be the accountant or attorney, which are usually the one of them that has the tightest relationship with the client, a lot of times their ego gets in the way and they don't want to play nice in a sandbox and it disrupts the process. So, you know, if you have teamwork, a client who doesn't bifurcate, somebody who kind of doesn't have to be the lead, but at least keeps the ball rolling, and a client who's willing to, to you know, allocate time. That's, that's probably the most important. And then ultimately, a client that says, you know what, I owe it to my wife or husband, I owe it to my children and my grandchildren, and I owe it to the business and my employees, because the business is almost like another child. And some of the right. employees are almost like children to the, to the owner of the business. They've been with them for a very long period of time. So I owe it to all of these people to not have a disaster when I'm not around. So I'm going to have to make some really, really tough choices. And I'm going to have to have some really heart to heart, difficult conversations with my children and maybe my spouse. That's not going to be easy, but I'm going to kind of man up and I'm going to take the responsibility to do it because I, as a parent, I say this all the time when I speak on whenever I'm interviewed that at the end of the day, when you're up there and you look down or you have that moment before you go up there to kind of just like look at the surroundings, the scorecard isn't, oh my, I had two kids who went to MIT and one kid who went to Harvard and they're all smart. And they all make millions of dollars, but they've been divorced 16 times and they don't talk to their kids and they don't talk to each other. Like to me, does that mean I did a good job as a parent? Maybe I just had good genes and I created smart kids, but they're dysfunctional. You know, right. what really at the end of the day is the scorecard is what was my relationship like with my kids and my spouse and their relationship with each other. And when I'm no longer here, are they going to be together for Christmas or Hanukkah or Thanksgiving? And are they going to have a relationship? They're going to care about each other. They're going to watch each other's back and take care of each other. That's the scorecard at the end of the day. And if I, I'm, I risk it a little bit by opening up, but if I don't, I'm going to leave yeah. a disaster and then there's going to be a war and there's going to be litigation mm -hmm. and there's going to be fighting and there's no way they're going to get along if I just leave a disaster. So, mm -hmm. so it's kind of a combination of all of those things. And you could see there's a lot of things that make it work. That's why it doesn't usually work because it takes a lot of things to go right to get you there. Yeah, and there's a couple of things I just want to touch on there. Number one is, I, I think you're obviously you're 100 correct. Is like getting the right 
external third party professionals involved uh, is, is critical for the start because also it's a lot easier sometimes to say, well, this is what the professional advisor is saying. So, you know, so you, you're not delivering always a message just from yourself. Good guy. Uh, and the, yeah, exactly. And the second thing is just like you said, is, um, is I, I think people, people think that it'll never happen to my family like we'll all be fine you know we'll be fine we'll get on fine once you know our parents pass everything will be okay because and and that's just rare that to be honest when when a situation like this comes up it's rarely the case or there's things that come up or whatever but it's rarely smooth and I think yeah I think it does behove the the person who's on the way out to make sure that they leave as much structure in place to avoid what is unfortunately going to be some inevitable conflict. You know, John, you, you, it was a very intuitive comment that you just made and very on point. That sometimes is one of the big issues that you hear from people. Oh, my, this is not my kids. My, they all yeah. get along. My kids are great. They're all perfect. They're all, and it's like, you know, sometimes I, I feel like, you know, like you want to like smack them in the head, you know, and like say like, are you for real? I said, not only, not only is that kind of ridiculous, but the one part of it that's totally ridiculous is there's two things. Like, let's say again, John, you're it's a man. You're the you know you're the mm -hmm. patriarch of the family, and it's your business. And I say to you, John, look, there's two. There's a couple of things you don't know. You've never met your wife when she's a widow, so you know her as a wife and a mother. You don't know her as a widow. So you have no idea how women can change when they become a widow from being a wife and a mother when they had their husband who was the breadwinner and they always knew everything was fine and have to worry about things. They change, they get nervous. In addition, you've never experienced your children not having their parents there because sometimes they play nice in the sandbox because hmm. Maybe they sit there and go like, I don't want to piss off mom and dad. They got a lot of money. And if, I, if I'm a jerk, you know, who knows? They may like, you know, not give me anything. So, so they withhold all that crap that's inside them. <clears throat> and then it gets all released when mom and dad <clears throat> are not there. And that's why I say to people, you just, you, you're, you're not going to have the opportunity to know what your kids are going to be like in that situation because it's going to happen when you're not there. So you have to assume that your kids in some way or another are not going to be perfect. Yeah, no, and, uh, absolutely. And I think uh, it's probably be a good exercise for people sometimes who haven't faced that situation yet is to ask a couple of people who've been through it and said and said, oh, so when your when your you know folks passed on you know how was the process was it nice and smooth because most people have war stories and that might waken people up a little bit. And they also, John, the stuff people fight over, like, I get yeah. it. I mean, look, if you got a multi, multi-million dollar business and like one son or daughter gets it and the others don't, you know, that's a lot of money. It's animosity. I get it. There's kids, there's daughters that loved each other and mom gave one one ring and a different ring to the other one. And the two daughters never speak again for the rest mm -hmm. of their life. And they were like closest friends because they view mom's evaluation of love by what gift they got. And like, mom must have loved you more than me because she gave you that ring that I wanted as much as you. And she never told me about it. And now I'm gonna hold it against you that mom loved you more than me. And they don't have to talk to each other for you know 40 years over a stupid ring. You know what I'm saying? So when you got millions and millions and millions of dollars, <laughs> you could only imagine yeah. what could happen. And I think that's, uh, and that goes back to your point earlier, I think where you have to confront this head on, like get the professionals around you and start to make proper provisions and maybe explain and have, have those conversations and explain, have those conversations while you still can, but explain even in your, your scenario there, have an explanation. Why does one person get one thing and one person gets the other? And maybe there's an opportunity to negotiate that while everybody's still alive. And look at that and using that you know, kind of stupid yeah. example. No, 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 but it's the a good smartest one. thing in the world to do if, if you have two daughters and you know they both want that ring is you tell them I'm selling all my jewelry, <laughs> selling it all, okay? And, and basically I'm just gonna give money to everybody or there's a piece of jewelry and you're all gonna get money and whoever wants to pay the most to the other two kids 
for that piece of jewelry. You could have it. So it's not like I gave it to one of you that I love more. You figure out who wants to spend the most money for that ring, who it means the most to. And then nobody could fight because my sister was willing to spend a hundred grand for the ring. I wasn't going to pay a hundred grand. So let her have the ring, you know, like yeah. rather than just saying you get this ring and you get this ring and like, then they can't stand each other forever. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent point. And unfortunately, I mean, yeah, we're, we're rational creatures often and emotional and irrational creatures when it comes to comes to stuff like this. So um, going back to what you were saying earlier about when you get those professionals around you, where, where have, when you work with people, how have you seen this work the best? I mean, you know, working with the professionals also uh, when your clients are having good conversations with their family members. Uh, I mean, how does it when it works really well, what does it look like? Well, it's kind of like what I said earlier, you know, mm -hmm. you got somebody who, you know, knows it's important and they're going to address it and they, you know, they have a team. I mean, one of my, you know, my unique selling proposition, what I think makes me unique is that, mm -hmm. you know, on a team, you know, there's usually an accountant, there's an attorney, there's insurance guys, they're financial advisors, yep. pension people. You know, I, I kind of say I'm like the person in the United Nations, like they're speaking Portuguese. Russian, Hebrew, you know, uh, you know, Spanish and Italian, and they got the headsets on because you're not going to know what people are saying. It's, it's not being translated. I'm like the translator, like I'm the person in that meeting that understands everything about every one of those areas. So nothing kind of slips through the cracks. Most of the advisors are very smart and they know their stuff and they know enough about what everybody else does. But there's, there's things that each person does that they don't totally get. Yep. I'm kind of like the glue. I'm the one who like, I'll sit with the client. Like they'll say to me after like, Steve, you put it in such like English, like my lawyer is smart, but like when they try to explain things to me, I never understand what they're saying. Like, you know, you take it and make it real. And I could kind of put my hands around it. And like, and, 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 and I'm usually the one, the quarterback to kind of push the process along. And as long as the accountant and attorney, even though they may know the client for a longer period of time, it doesn't because I'm not looking to be them. I'm not a, I'm not a lawyer. And even though I'm a CPA, I have no interest to be their accountant. So I'm not like in competition with them. So as long as they can kind of say, like, you know, Steve plays a role because he's there for this purpose, like this client, we're going to be working with this client on other stuff. And if we're the one in charge, the client will always give a reason to not deal with it because there's some other important issue when Steve's involved. Other than Steve doing this, he really doesn't serve any other purpose. So we might as well focus on it, you know? So that's kind of when it works, that's kind of how it works. Yeah, no, and I love that because, I mean, it is it is getting the expert to corral everything and to run point on it all. And, and, and you know, bringing in an expert to do a particular job. And as I said, I mean, it takes a lot of the emotion out of it. It takes, it, it gives you a kind of like a, a way, you know, if you're the if you're the person with the business, it, it, as we said earlier, it gives you a way of saying, well, what well, this is what Stephen says we should do. Yep. Yeah. Um, and 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 do you think uh, it, it, do you think uh, of the work you do? Do you think more people are starting to recognize the need to hire people like you and do things like this? Because I mean, let's face it. I mean even a small business or something today, I mean, it's still complicated and it's still, there's a lot of moving parts and regulation, all this kind of stuff that it's, it's, it's getting more complicated and let's face the laws around, uh, around inheritance and all that stuff keep coming up for changes and tweaks and all of that good stuff. So it is, it is very, it, it can get quite complicated and it's going to be a tough thing to kind of do on your own. Yeah, look, I, it's very complicated. And, you know, every time we get a new president, especially if they're from a different party, you know, it starts all over again. So, you know, yeah. you had Obama and you, know, you had Clinton and you had Bush, you know, then, you, you know, then you had Obama, then you had Trump, now you have Biden. It's like we keep flip flopping. And and obviously, when the Democrats come in, they usually want to tax the wealthy people more. And when the Republicans come in, they try not to do that. So it's hard to plan because like you're planning for the next four years and you don't know what's going to happen. Um, I think I think well, I think um, I think that the um, what was I going to say the the I think that the one of the issues is that you know people as they get older they see they see friends they see people who are passing away you know they've experienced things it, it's it's just you know 
that's sometimes that's usually what motivates somebody. You yeah. know, they have, they have a friend, they have a relative that passed away. They saw that, you know, they have a friend in business that it was a disaster after they died. And it's kind of like they say, yeah, you know, I know it's not, you know, I'm always going to say it's not going to happen to me, but it's going to happen to me. And, and this was almost like a smack in my head to say, you know, I, I got to get my act together, you know? So mm -hmm. that's usually, it's usually a friend, a family member, somebody who they see it hit them and they say, I'm going to have the same exact issues. And basically I better do something about it. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good point. It's, it's like that thing, isn't it? Like when the best time to plant a tree was like 20 years ago and the second best time <laughs> is now, right? Exactly. Or today or something. Yeah, no, I, I, I could see that and I could see how, uh, how that is a good wake up call for people. This, this has been fascinating, um, Stephen, like great, great information. Uh, all of Stephen's information is going to be below this uh, video. And I would absolutely encourage you if, if as you listen and watch this, if this sounds like you, if you're in that situation, please do check out uh, Stephen's uh, uh, services. And definitely, I would definitely recommend you consider like working with a professional. Um, before we go, Stephen, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself. Uh, okay, so um, background, CPA, MBA, started out in one of the big accounting firms, KPMG, Pete Marwick, mm -hmm. worked for JP Morgan, uh, have my MBA in finance, last 30 plus years, have my consulting firm, um, SHG Planning, um, you know, been married to the same woman for over 40 years, have two kids, three grand, two grandkids with a third on the way, um, and basically uh, my passion you know outside of business i do a lot of venture investing and private investing and i was a big brother for many years from you know big brothers you know big mm -hmm. sisters and i still have a close relationship with my little brother and that's where my passion is you know underprivileged kids with education and stuff yeah i love it i'm not going to ask you who's getting your business before we go <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Stephen, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you all for watching and listening. And I will see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thanks for having me.